simple takeaways that you're going to have to be able to do from this chapter is reconcile a petty cash account. Anybody ever heard of that term, petty cash? What do you think it is, Lance? Uh, it's, it's cash that you have on hand. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. Cash you have on hand for random expenses, right? So, uh, for example, I just stopped at Albertsons on the way to work this morning and I got our administrative assistant a card and a poinsettia to say thanks. Okay, that was out of my own pocket. But if I was in a business and I wanted somebody to go do that, I'm not going to send her with a blank check to Albertsons, right? It's just like, here, here's 30 bucks. Go get it. Bring me the change and bring me the receipt. That's a petty cash fund. And businesses keep them for like a hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks sitting around, right? It's not a high exposure area because it's not very much cash, but you still got to reconcile. So that's one thing that I'm going to want you to do. And then the other thing that we're going to have to be able to do by the end of this chapter is reconcile a bank account. For those of you, I don't think anybody in here has taken my finance class yet. You're taking it next semester. Okay, so this will be a little redundant for you. We're going to learn how to reconcile a bank account. And I can tell you for years and years and years before we had digitized banking, most people uh, that had any uh, positive relationship with their cash flow got a piece of paper every month from the bank and they took out their checkbook and they physically reconciled them. For most of you younger people, you're like, what's a checkbook, right? Because you just, that's just not how you manage your money. And you probably don't even get a paper statement from your bank, right? So it's like, why am I doing this? Well, two reasons. One reason is, is that businesses actually still do that. They, they reconcile their physical bank accounts. And they're digitized, but whatever. Um, and the second reason is, even if it's just you as an individual, and it's not a big deal anymore because my kids are out of college and they have proper jobs. But when they were when they were in college, they'd look on their little, you know, oh, I got you know sixteen dollars in my checking account, and then they go out on Friday night and spend thirty bucks, but they'd forgotten that they, you know, that their subscription for something was coming up for Netflix or something. So they were constantly getting overdrawn, which is very frustrating to their mother because obvious reasons. Okay. So that's the other reason that we like to um, reconcile our bank accounts is so that we know where we are at any given point in time. Okay, so with that said, um, what is an internal control system for? It's to do four things. It's to take care of your assets. It's to make sure that you've got a reliable accounting system. It's to make sure that you are efficient and it's to make sure that your company's policies are being upheld. So, I mean, and you can think about it, it's like something like a fleet too. If you've got a fleet of cars, what are you gonna require before an employee takes one of your cars? Um, well, yeah, you wanna know your car's safe, absolutely. So say you just join Carl Tyler Chevrolet and they want you to, run a car up to Thompson Falls because somebody wants to try it for a couple of days. What are they going to ask you for, Tyler? Yeah, of course. They're going to make sure you have a driver's license. They're going to check your insurance. They're going to check your driving record and make sure that you don't have eight DUIs posted to it, right? So, I mean, that's just like, it's like they've got to have company policies that say like, here's how we keep everything safe, right? So pretty, I mean, again, so much of this like feels common sense. To me, um, this is actually pretty important. Have you guys heard about this in any of your business classes yet? Sarbanes Oxley. Um, so um, it's this is probably golly now thirty years old maybe, but um, it requires that a publicly held company. What does that mean again? What's one more time? There's stocks on the New York Stock Exchange or the American Stock Exchange or NASDAQ, right? There's the free trade of ownership that publicly traded companies certify how they've developed their internal control system. So if I've got stock in GE, I'm not going to wake up tomorrow morning and be like, oh my gosh, GE went bust because there was tons of fraud because there was no internal control. Sarbanes-Oxley requires them to show their auditors how they develop their system of internal control. And the auditors got to evaluate it and it's all overseen uh, by a federal board.
Okay. Um, so without diving too deep into this, and again, I feel like this is a lot of this is pretty common sense, but okay, if I'm, let's make up a, let's just go with Carl Tyler Chevrolet. I mean, how many, do you guys know where the company is? How many cars do you think is out on that lot? Again, a couple thousand, a couple thousand. And I mean, I know the cars have a huge range of <laughs> cost, but let's say they paid 20,000 for each of those cars. And that's probably a small number. That's $40 million of inventory sitting out there. Then they've got that huge ass building, which has got to be 40,000 square feet. And um, I'm sure there's lots of cash accounts. They do lots of financing. They take in payments. I mean, so pretty complex, right? Kind of a lot of stuff to take care of. How many people you reckon is in their accounting department? Just take a rough guess. I, I would say that's probably a good guess. I don't know. Um, I've toured the facility once and it looked like the accounting department was pretty big. I'd say 10 is a good guess, okay? So, really, really, really critical here is to establish responsibility. So if I'm the gal in Carl Tyler's accounting department that's responsible for posting payments for financed vehicles, what's the danger in that? If I'm physically opening, you know, getting check, and I know that's not, but that some people do still like check and kind of open it and sign it. What's the danger to Carl Tyler if I'm the only person that does that? Yeah, the danger is that I'm going to be like, damn, Christmas is coming up and I haven't saved, and here's a check for 580 bucks, and I can easily change Carla Tyler to Carla Tyler because that's my name. I'd be a little silly there. And put it in my account, right? So, how do they keep that kind of thing from happening? You establish responsibilities, and then number five, really critical. Divide responsibilities for related transactions. So one person takes it out of the mailbox and logs it in, and another person deposits it. You've just divided responsibilities, and now I can't do that, can I? Because the check was logged in by land. Okay. It's called division of responsibility. It's a very difficult in small business, right? Very, very difficult in small business. I, for a lot of my clients, tax clients, one of the things that they'll do if they just have a small business, like I have lots of guys like, I'm a hydro engineer, and then I've got one gal that does all my billing and takes care of all my finances and blah, blah, blah. Or I'm a drywaller contractor, and you know, you get the point. They'll have me at the end of the year reconcile the rate. And that provides that second layer of dividing responsibilities because I can see if there is a malappropriation of funds during the year. You want to bond your employees, you want to make sure there's adequate records, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is just going through all those, obviously establishing responsibility, you know who that is, what that means. Maintaining adequate records, um, you know, so much of this is outdated, you guys. You'll never in your lifetimes, young folks especially, are never going to see the same as, you know, forms and stuff like that. And you gotta file one here and file one there, and you know, I mean, that just doesn't exist in our world anymore, does it? For, for most of you. So, right now, I have a small business in the Yeah. And somebody asked me why people don't have to sign the papers. They're taking any kind of data. I mean, they still manually enter in the working file and get it in, but I mean, there are still little bastions of that still there. I mean, I've got a rancher who still brings me in a big lecture hall. Well, this is cows. This is cows. How many huffers do we have? I mean, it's, it's actually pretty funny. Um, and I can tell you, he's, he's not big as I've been getting poison. He's in his late 70s, and I'm going to be getting that ledger book every year and tell he's no longer there. So, um, um, yeah, so most of this is gone. You just gotta have a really solid um, piece of software and a way to, to make sure that it's accurate. If you handle a lot of cash, you should be bonded. What does that mean? It means um, in the example of uh, cash to pay for. What's a good example of something still people still use lots of cash to pay for? 
Really? really? You think people show up at $30,000? Sure, I'm on your boat. Do they? <laughs> I mean, do they? I don't know. Um, it would be more like the Bible or any of the house or something like that. That, that's actually is a good example. We had a, a bathroom done a couple of years ago in the Tyler. Every like second day he came in, he's like, I need 500 bucks. And I'd have to go figure out like he bucked out and did it 5,000 and I'm giving him 500 in cash. Because I mean, they're, they're so strapped for cash, you can take that 500 bucks and pay his guys for the Right? So, okay, that's a great example. So, bonding means the company's purchased an insurance policy. So if that money disappeared it, with, in the hands of one of his employees, the insurance company would pay for them. A huge example, again, it doesn't sound like any of you have really bar and restaurant background, but I went to grad school in California. I worked in Nevada at a couple of different casinos. Oh boy, hell yeah, you're bond, bonded there, right? I mean, fingerprinted, bonded, the whole criminal check and everything. And I'm like, I'm serving drinks at Benihana's. I mean, <laughs> but it's a, it's a pretty big deal. And if you touch the asset, my example of the check, if you touch the asset, then you should not be dealing with the accounting records. What does collude mean? If you have collusion, it's kind of game over. There's really nothing you can do to protect against collusion. What is that? That's it right there. Collusion is when, yeah, Lance is opening the checks and I'm posting the deposits to the accounting records and we get together and we're like, hey, we can split the proceeds. There's almost nothing you can do internal control wise if you have collusion. Separation of duties we talked about. Um, and then having an auditor come in and do an independent evaluation. Um, okay, blockchain. Anybody know what that is? Can you, what, can you explain it, Lance? I better say I can. They can like vaguely explain it. Um, it's basically uh, like a program that um, enters a bunch of. I'm going to come on this language, but it's it has a decentralized program that. Registers a bunch of transactions, and then all of the separate servers verify the transactions on the other one. Yeah, and where did we first hear about the word blockchain? Um, I don't know if people heard about Bitcoin. In relation to Bitcoin. But it's certainly the first time I ever heard of the word. And I've probably read 10 pieces that are labeled something like, you know, Bitcoin for idiots or starters cryptocurrency, and I'm still like, person and I get to the end and I just I don't know but it's basically exactly what he said where you mine unique combinations of bits and bytes computer bits and bytes and they have value because they're unique and it will always that transaction that that unique group of bits and bytes will always follow that transaction so for example where it's really important like in my world of sustainability is if I go and buy this sweater from a company that tells me they're sustainable. Okay, and I can look all through them up and yeah, they use solar energy, power their warehouse, and they treat their employees, blah, 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 blah. But you know what I don't know? I don't know where the cotton comes from. Lots of our cotton, like in the gap and places like that, comes from Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and children labor is picket. I don't want to buy a sweater with the children labor is picket. But with blockchain, I can see where that cotton is from. I can follow every little bit of that sweater wrap with source. So now I can make a choice. See what I'm saying? So you can't ever, the, the point of blockchain is that you've always got a detailed record associated with everything. It can never be changed. It can never be hidden. It can never be destroyed. And blockchain is really, uh, it almost takes fraud out of the picture because it's these unique um, bits of technology that are associated with your assets and your products. Horrible, horrible uh, job of explaining it. But does, does anybody else, do, do you guys know what blockchain is or have a feel for what it is? Do you know what Bitcoin is or cryptocurrency? 
So how, how would you explain that? I mean, it's just not what the currency is. Okay. How's it facilitated? Uh, uh, you're, you're, so, so far, I think you're doing a great job of layman's explanation. So I asked, what is cryptocurrency? And Hayden said that it's, the, it's a new form of cash. You have to, I said, how do you get it? He said, you have to mine it. <laughs> Can anybody cool. help him? What does that mean, mine it? It's a, uh, I don't, I don't know like, how to explain it, but it's like, you, you know how it's like software being too hard and too hard. Mm -hmm. so I, that's how I understand it. So mine is like, sometimes the, like, the more you mine, the higher or more. Okay, so you're you're close. I do actually know how they mine it. There's we had a mine. Go ahead. You get one Bitcoin. And we had a mining service out here in Bonner. And they took as much power every day for all the servers to mine as it took to power Missoula for a month. So for somebody that's concerned with fossil fuel consumption, that was a pretty big deal out there. Uh, it's shut. It's shut because we required, they, they came here for two reasons. We have cheap power and it's cold climate. So those all those servers generate a ton of heat. So you don't want to be doing this in Arizona. You want to be doing this where it's cold and the power is cheap. And that's where they go. And they come into the community selling it on the fact that they're going to create a lot of jobs. There were four jobs created in Missoula. And the sound decimated the people in Bonner because these servers are running trying to mine this unique, what did you call it, Tyler? A unique code or equation. Yeah, code or equation. So it, it no longer exists there. But we're using blockchain in business for that, the identification and tracking purposes that we all first heard about with cryptocurrency. Okay. Cash and cash equivalent. So this is this is the uh, this is the part that we're going to actually do some numbers around and not just shitty chat. Um, okay, so we have to protect our cash and cash equivalents. What's a cash equivalent? A cash equivalent is like a money market account or a short-term certificate of deposit or something that's so close to cash we call it cash. It's not actually you know coins and dollars, but um, it's very 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 close to cash. Um, currency coins, bank accounts, highly convertible liquid investments. They're very close to the maturity date and not sensitive to changes. So what, what, what do we do with cash management? I mean, what's the whole point or purpose of it? Twofold, we've got to make sure that we've got it coming in in a timely way so that we can pay our bills as they come due. It's the very same in our lives. Right, we have bills that come due every month. It doesn't matter that somebody owes me money. They're not going to pay me for three months because my landlord wants her check tomorrow for the rent. Right, so it's timing cash receipts and cash payments, and then um, every business, much like you probably in your personal life too, wants a little bit of play. Right, a bare minimum that you keep in your account, so that no matter like if something really tragic happens or something unexpected happens, it's like I've got X sitting there. For a business, that's called working capital. Well, yeah, it's a work. It's it's a it's a, it's a working capital reserve, technically. Okay. In years of my life, that would be called our savings account, but in a business, it's called a working capital reserve. How do you manage cash? Well, you want people that owe you money to pay you, so you want to actively be going after your receivables. Obviously, we saw when we were using our special journals that it's um, of our benefit when somebody gives us good terms to defer paying our payables. So accelerate your receivables, defer your payables. Um, plan your exp expenditures. And then this is a biggie. Um, and hopefully your business will be so lucky. Is that, Do you want your extra cash sitting in your checking account? Why not? It's not generating anything. 
what might you do with your excess cash? Sure, and what? Sure, you might put it in the market. You might put it in real property. What else? More assets. More assets because assets generate revenue, right? So you're going to invest in your asset base because Carl Tyler, you're going to buy more inventory. Every time you move a piece of metal, you generate profit, right? Okay, great. You guys know all this. I'm not going to really know this. Okay, this we do need to know. All right, so. Sometimes errors in making change are discovered from the difference in the cash in the cash register and the record of the amount of cash receipts. So this is, you know, this is a bar or restaurant. Um, I bet you, I can't even imagine. What percentage do you think in your average bar or restaurant is now on, are, are now on cards? What percentage of transactions? Well, no, just like in general customers, like what percentage do you think people still pay with cash? Yeah. A lot. Okay, maybe. I mean, that. Let me just tell you that right there. Super dangerous. Really, you want your credit card sitting behind the the where everybody's partying? And I mean, really? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm that asshole that every single drink, I'm like, here's my card, get it back. <laughs> it's like I'm not sitting behind the bar. I'm like, huh? Um, okay, so you're saying you think a lot of people still do pay cash. So they're going to have to reconcile every day their. If you're like from, you're from mm -hmm. Probably all cash. cash. But if you are, you know, people, you have more cards. cards. Great point. Great point. So it's dependent upon the what the scene is. But, cash. Yeah, probably. Okay. Boy, I haven't been in there forever. Um, okay, so let's just kind of go through this. So at the end of the night, I'm at the Desperado and my cash register shows I had 550 bucks of sales. And the cash in the cash register is 555 bucks. Am I over or sh short? I'm obviously over. How much do I record as my sales? The 555 or the 550 that my cash register showed? You record the 550. So you always record the revenue at the amount that came off of the register. Okay, so you got to record it at the amount that came off the register. Then your cash is obviously, it's the actual physical amount of cash because that's what's going to the bank. So what kind of account is this cash over and short then? Where's that going to go? p &L or balance sheet? Not a lot. Do I owe it to someone? No. Not an asset. The asset is the cash. <laughs> You're circling the obvious. It's actually an expense or a revenue, depending upon whether it's a credit or a debit. So it's going to show up on your PL. In this case, is it going to be a revenue or an expense, so to speak? A revenue. Obviously, if you do this every day, at the end of the month, your hope is that it's going to be hovering right around zero, right? Okay. So um, this one, my cash register showed 625 bucks. Um, but the count of cash in the register was 621. So same thing, you got to debit your cash for the amount of cash, you got to credit your sales for the real sales. And then this guy is just a plug. So between yesterday and today, I've got a $5 credit, I had a $4 debit after two days, I've got a $1 credit. And honestly, at the end of the month, you're hoping it's pretty, you know, so your cash over in short should be a pretty small number on your P and L. Okay. Oh, great, great question. Yeah, this is, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. It's going to go into the cash cash receipts. There's not a subsidiary ledger because there's no AR. Mm -hmm. Yep, in the other column, you probably would have a cash over in short. 
You would have probably one column. Great question. And um, when it went one way, you'd have to have a negative number. So I probably I would probably do my overs as a positive number and my shorts as a negative number. So that would have been positive five and negative four. So it would end up in the positive one. Okay, keys to control the cash payment. Nobody does vouchers anymore. Okay, petty cash. Second thing you need to know how to do. This is for little tiny stuff. You run out to get a cake for somebody's birthday. You've got to, you know, go get some envelopes because you got a mailing that's due tonight. And crap, we don't have envelopes, or you know, you need to go ship something. Okay, little stuff that takes a little bit of cash. Here's how it works. I'm, I just started a new business or I'm realizing I'm having more of this kind of stuff. I don't want to keep cutting manual checks for it. I'm like, let's just start a petty cash fund. So I write a check to petty cash, essentially, in other words, to myself. And I debit petty cash and I credit cash. Where does petty cash show up on my financial statements? Huh? Yeah, it's an asset. It's a current asset. Right? Okay, great. November 1st, I established a petty cash account. Then look what happened all month. And then I'm going to have you journalize this for me, please. So now I'm at the end of the month. And I have spent $71.30 of my petty cash account. I wanted to get back to $75. Make the journal entry to do that. So set up a little journal, date, description, debit, credit. And based upon this is the stuff that I bought out of my petty cash fund in the month of November, make the journal entry to get my account back to 75 bucks. I mean, obviously I have to write another check, right? So make a journal entry to get me back there. So now I've only got like $3.70 left. I want to get it back to 75 bucks. How am I going to do that? I've got to allocate these expenses to where they belong. And then I'm going to write another check for So basically at the end of the month, I'm going to write a check for 7130 and I have to record the fact that $15.05 went to my inventory and 475 went to office supply expense, et cetera, et cetera. So now my fund has $75 back in it, right? And at the end of the next month, I have to go and see what it was spent on and write another check and re-establish the petty cash fund. And that's how I get whatever it was spent on into my PL. Okay, does that make sense? Pretty easy, intuitive. You got to have one person in charge of petty cash. It's not a big amount of money, but you have to have one person in charge. And I mean, businesses still use them all the time. Nobody wants to be writing out checks for $4 and $15 and $5 and blah, blah, blah. Well, anytime we credit cash, where does it have to go? Cash payments journal, right? Good question. Okay. 
This is talking about, oh my gosh, what happens at the end of the month? And it's like, crap, somebody didn't bring me a receipt. You just use your cash over in short. Okay, you just use cash over in short. And I will tell you something else that was just, um, just general words of wisdom. When I first got out of college or out of grad school and started working in accounting and I'm like the kind of person that I want everything to balance down to the penny and we need this to all work out and there's gotta be an explanation of it that nobody cares. I mean, if you're getting close, just use miscellaneous expense and get on with your life, okay? Nobody cares that everything's down to the penny. It is not a good allocation of time. Um, no, you can't do that. I can do that, you can't do that. But you would do that. And it was so silly. I look back on it now, like this inordinate amount of time I would spend trying to find. Let's see. Yep, bank statement blank. There we go. Voila. Okay. So, yay. Um, so what we're doing is we are going to go to page 303 in our book. And we're going to do this together. So let me just back up now that as you guys find page 303 and just tell you what, what it is we're doing. So um, I'm not going to go through deposit tickets and checks. Everyone knows what a check is. Okay, let's start here. So um, once a month, Every business and really literally every person should too reconcile their bank statement to you know either their checkbook or their general ledger. And let me just tell you this straight away, the numbers aren't gonna be the same. And what we're trying to do is figure out how to make them the same. So I get a bank statement. Let's look at this one. I get a bank, bank statement that says, I've got $2,050 in the bank right now, okay? Here's the name of my company, 1031's my statement date, blah, 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 $2,050. And then I go and I look in my, wait, is this not the same one? Ugh, irritating, oh yeah, it is. I go and look in my checkbook and it says I have $1,405. Which is right, the bank who says I have 2050 or my checkbook that says I have 1,405. Those are really different numbers, aren't they? Well, okay, here's the answer. Neither, neither is correct. Here's why, here's why. The bank doesn't know about some stuff that I do know about my check register. And I've got some things that have happened to my bank account that I don't know about. So I've got to reconcile those two things. What do you think, for example, might happen that the bank knows about that I don't? Like, give me an example. Something I didn't put in my checkbook, but that has happened at the bank level. That's on my bank statement, but not in my checkbook. Yeah, an error, absolutely. And by the way, everyone's like, oh, banks don't ever make errors. I have caught maybe in the course of my life four or five misapplied mortgage payments, which never served me well. Okay, so it's just people, right? People are doing the input. Lots of stuff is digitized. But anyways, okay, an error. What about if they charged you a fee, like an insufficient funds fee or your monthly bank service charge? Okay, so those are things the bank would know about, but you don't. What's an example of something you know about that the bank doesn't? A thousand percent. They're called outstanding checks. A check I wrote to somebody. Hey, Andrew, here's a check for my half of the rent this month. And you're waiting to get the rent from the other roommate too, and then you're going to deposit it all at once. So I've entered it in my checkbook, but it hasn't cleared the bank. That's called an outstanding check. 
Another thing that can happen that I know about that the bank doesn't is like an outstanding check, but it's a deposit. It's called a deposit in transit. So it's the 30th of October and I had somebody send me a check to do some tax planning for him. And I signed the check. I put it in the mail with the deposit slip for 400 bucks. I put it in my checkbook register, but the bank doesn't get it. And then they send me the check, the bank statement on 1031. That's a deposit in transit. So where I'm going with all this is just, it's just kind of one, two, three. You need to know the beginning, the ending balance from the bank and the ending balance on your checkbook. And they're not gonna be the same number. Then you've got to figure out what each other knows that the other one doesn't. And both of those columns are gonna come back and equal the same number. And that is actually your adjusted bank balance. We're gonna do that. So first off, here's a visual. One column, cash balance per bank. Your bank statement says X. You gotta add the deposits in transit. The deposits that the person knew about, but the bank doesn't, and you gotta subtract the outstanding checks. Checks that have been written, but that haven't cleared the bank. And then plus or minus any bank errors gives you your balance over here. The other column is gonna to come to the same number. These two numbers have to be the same. This starts out with your cash balance in your books or your check registers. Anything that was debited into your bank statement that you didn't know about, like an interest payment or collection, minus any of your bank fees, non-sufficient fund checks, things like that, and minus any book errors. So I thought it would be best, again, just to do one together. That'll take us this last probably 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'm going to tell you what we're going to do on Thursday for review for the final. Okay? And that's really all I'm going to have you do for homework in this chapter. Petty cash, basically know what Sarbanes-Oxley and internal control is, and then be able to do a bank rec. Okay, so the way we're gonna do this, um, since you guys are online, let's go over here. So um, Veronica and Trevor, this is what we're working for, working from. Um, you are going to need to replicate this on just a piece of paper to the best of your ability. And we're going to use the data on page 303 to do this together. And I'm going to walk us through this. Okay, view, zoom. Okay. Why is that doing that? Okay. So again, here's our two sections. Here's the bank balance is all the top. And then down here, we're doing the checkbook balance. This line, the two bolded numbers have to equal. So let's start. Everyone on page 303? Okay. 303, uh, 8-4. The following information is available to reconcile Gucci's book balance of cash with its bank statement. Um, the first thing they tell us is the cash balance according to the accounting records is $1,610 and the bank statement cash balance, balance is 1,900 bucks. So that's our starting point. Put those two numbers into the reconciliation where you think they belong. Uh, yeah, at the bottom of page 3 3, it says need to know 8 4. Everyone see what we're working from? 3 3. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yep, yep, yep. So you're saying the following information is available. 
Okay, uh, Trevor and Veronica, do you guys know what you're working off of? Okay, cool. Veronica, you okay? Great. All right, so just fill in that, you know, we're just on A. We got our bank statement. They're telling us we got 1900 bucks. I look at my own records and it says, I don't know if I'm going to be able to. Oh, crap, you guys. I don't know. This is, I've got this as an image, so I'm not going to be able to enter data in here, I don't think. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, all right, I'm just going to have to do the best I can, which is tell you what to write in. So we should have $1,900 written in here, right? Bank balance. And then down here on row four, how much do we have in the checkbook? uh 1610 right okay b gucci's 1231 daily cash receipts of 800 bucks were placed in the bank's night depository on 1231 but are not on the bank statement so your question to yourself is always who knows about this and who doesn't so who knows about this and who doesn't? Exactly, my, my check register knows, but the bank doesn't. So that means you have to adjust the bank balance because the bank doesn't know about it, right? Is that an outstanding check or a deposit in transit? Yeah, and you can go right down in here and fill it out. The date's 1231. And the amount is whatever they just told us, 800 bucks. Yeah, just right here, yep. Okay, so I've got one and outstanding deposits or, or transit deposits and transit or outstanding deposits are always like on the last day of the month. Okay, then the next one is Gucci's comparison. They took their canceled checks, compared it to the base statement, and three of the checks that they wrote didn't get cashed. So does the who doesn't know about it? The bank or the checkbook? The bank. So again, anything the bank doesn't know about has to be entered up in the bank stuff. And there's a whole place right here to put our checks and withdrawals outstanding. So enter those. No, no, they just, and withdrawals aren't gonna ever be outstanding because that's auto, isn't it? There might be one on the 31st again. Yeah, no, just put them in order. And then tally them up. What's the total of my outstanding checks? Okay, next thing. So what do I have, 700 bucks of outstanding checks? D, when the December checks are compared with entries in the accounting records, it's found the check number 6267 had been correctly subtracted from the bank balance for 340 bucks, but it was entered in the accounting records at 430. So is this something that the bank doesn't know about or that the check register doesn't know about? Something the check register doesn't know about. So I'm not going to say it. I'm just going to throw this out there for you to think about. The check was entered in my check register for 430 bucks, but it was really $340. So what do you need to do down in here? 
Um, and it's not really five or six, it's an error. So just, I mean, enter it in either, whether you think it's a plus or a minus, just write the word error and then enter the amount in. In the check register for 430, but the check was only really 340. So what do I have to do in the check register, you guys? Add it or subtract it? I think I have to add it. My check register shows $430 deduction, but it was only a $340 deduction. Right? So my check register is artificially low. No, that's not what it says, is it? The check was for how many dollars for real? No. Nope. The check, check 6267 had been correctly drawn, subtracted from the bank balance for 340. But the number that I input into my software or entered on my register was 430. But the check was really 340. So do I add or subtract it? So why would you add it? Because if you, if you want to have your balance 340, Okay, what did they say that I have in the in the checkbook? Um, no, at the at the end of the month. It said I have 1610 in there, right? Okay. And when I was entering my checks, how much did I put that check in for in the check register? Right? So all my deposits and checks are up there, right? But I know that's not right now. It should be what? So what does that do to this number? Make it go up or down? Up. <laughs> I subtracted a too big number. So that makes the end number too small. So what do I have to do? Add it. Because it's not 1610. Okay. Right? I mean, I, I understand that this is one of these exercises, like if this number is too small, that, you know, da 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 da. They're just changing the, the bank account to like their bank account because they messed up. They, they messed up and input this. Oh, wow, really? They messed up and uh, and input that as 430, and it was just 340. Oh. It's just a, it's just a data entry error. And I've done it like um, I still carry a checkbook, and so you know I've done that before. Like I'll enter something in a hurry for like 10 bucks, and then at the end of the month I'm like, shit, why am I off? Well, it was really a hundred dollars, right? It was a hundred dollar check. So in that case, I've got to drop my balance by 90 dollars, don't I? Okay. So let's finish this off and make sure that we can get it to balance. So is everybody sold by the fact that down here, you've got to add $90 and you should just pencil in the word error and plus 90. Okay, E, the bank statement shows the bank collected a note receivable and interest uh, or, or collected a note receivable and increased Gucci's account for 470. Gucci had not recorded this transaction. So if I lend you money, I can ask you to just deposit into my bank account the payments. And that's what happened here. Gucci had not recorded it in their check register, but the bank knew it happened. Which of these two areas do I have to adjust? The top part or the bottom part? Wait, who knew about it? The bank. So where do I have to adjust? The checkbook. Okay, so I'll give you a second, figure out whether you think you need to add or subtract that.
And again, you're just this number six, you're just gonna have to pencil in your own little additions. One's called error and one's called receipt of notes receivable. Last one, you guys okay? You added 740 down in here, right under the error, right? Or 470, excuse me. I guess I've got transposition on the brain now. Last thing, F. The bank statement included an NSF check. What does that stand for? The bank statement included an NSF check for 150 bucks received from Prada in payment of its account. So Prada sent us a check. We entered it in our check register, but then what happened? It bounced. So what does the bank do when I have an NSF check? Yeah, they take it out of my account, right? non-sufficient funds so it's like if you owe me money and i enter it and i put it in and i put it through my checkbook and blah 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 and i send the deposit slip off and i'm like fine cool andrew paid me the 150 bucks he owes me and then i get my bank statement at the end of the month and they go no he didn't we couldn't get the money from his account so then we took it out of yours right and then um the, go ahead yeah yeah and then they also charge me $20 to print some checks. So take a second, think about who knows it, who doesn't, and where it goes. And maybe what I can do that might be easier, if I can do this pretty quickly. Um, yeah, this might be easier. I can't, I couldn't enter anything in that other one. And I'm not going to worry about typos right now. Well, I want you to think about whether you think it's a, it's a something. Who knew about these two things, the bank or the check register? The bank. So what do you have to adjust? Yeah, the check register. Exactly. Okay, now I want you, where did you enter those? Uh, 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 yep, now go and tally up the two columns and numbers and they should come to the same number and that's how much cash you really have. Wait, are we adding the total of um, 150 or 130? Well, wait, wait, wait. Both the 150 and the $20 are what? Additions or subtractions? They're subtractions. The bank charged me 20 bucks to print checks. That's clearly a subtraction. The $150 I entered as a deposit. But the bank's like, you don't get that money in your account because I couldn't pull it from his. So they zapped my account for that 150 bucks. You want to put the $20 in? Yeah, 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 exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're just going to have to kind of do your best filling in those little numbers. Sorry. No receivable seventy. No receivable four seventy. And what else happened there? Um, oh, error. Uh, 
Oh God, now I've forgotten what to do. What do I have to do? Oh, I have to add 90 bucks from that error. Okay, so first thing, do I add or subtract outstanding checks? So the bank thinks I have 1900 bucks, but there's three checks they don't know about. So that makes my bank balance go up when those clear? No, these are checks I wrote, right? We're on, we're on, we're on C. There's three checks outstanding that did not clear my account. Do I add or subtract outstanding checks? Subtract. And then there was an $800 deposit on the 31st, do I add or subtract that? Mm -hmm. so I'm going to adjust a bank balance, 2,000 bucks. Now, if I end up with that same number down here, I'm money. Yeah. So now answer me this. Who was right, the check register or the bank balance? Neither. How much cash do I really have? Two grand. Which of these two sets of transactions do I need to journalize, the top or the bottom? <laughs> the bottom. Go journalize them. Date, description, deb debit, credit. I've got to get these little four things. into my books because it's all stuff I just found out about. You can make two journal entries or you can make four, or you can make one, I don't care what you do, but each of them impact cash, obviously. So with the notes receivable, I got some cash, right? And they paid down their notes receivable. What account was the erroneous check coded to originally? Yeah, so that's what you have to correct. That was, yeah, you have to just correct whatever it was erroneously coded to before. And then for the checks, I don't know, I'd probably just call that office supplies, right? Printing checks.
And then the NSF check's a little trickier. What do I have to do with that? Somebody had sent me money they owed me and the check bounced. Go ahead. You do, yep. And what else do I have to do besides go to the general ledger? You guys know this, whenever you touch AR or AP, can you just use the control account? I've got to go into my subsidiary too. Because they still owe me the money, right? Here's what I need you to do for Thursday, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do in the last four minutes on Thursday. So to reinforce what we just did here, you're going to do E8-10 and 8-11 which we'll go over together. And you have to do these, okay? This isn't like come in and don't have them done because this is how you're gonna learn this. This is the very end of the semester, just finish strong. You gotta do a bank rec, you gotta do a petty cash analysis. And then the last thing that you need to do is you need to do E8-16, but I didn't get to showing you the calculation, but you can teach it to yourself um, using on page 304. The calculation is called days sales uncollected. It's a ratio. So these are the three things that you need to do. Okay, here's my intention on Thursday. And I'm, you, you need to be, you need to come prepared. 